All right, well, I've got 12 o'clock central, so let's go ahead and begin. Welcome to the third session of the 2018 National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium Brown Bagger webinar series. For those of you that haven't visited our website yet, I encourage you to do so at www.nbcec.org. And this is where recordings from our Brown Bagger sessions are housed. And the 2018 uh, sessions are being recorded as well and will be posted here uh, after, uh, after the uh, 2018 um, webinar series is, is complete. So encourage you if you weren't able to, to view all of them live uh, or if you're interested in past year's webinars uh, to go here and, and take a look at those. I'm your host for today, Matt Spangler. I'm a faculty member at the University of Nebraska. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. Bob Weber at Kansas State University and Dr. Dare Bullock at the University of Kentucky, uh, were also involved in uh, not only uh, uh, planning the agenda for this year's uh, Brown Bagger series, uh, but also will be uh, hosts uh, throughout the, the remainder or in previous sessions of this series as well. So we have two sets of speakers, if you will, today. Uh, first, Dr. Larry Keene from U.S. Mark will visit about breed differences for mature uh, cow weight. Uh, and then uh, second in the lineup, we actually have a panel of three breed association representatives, uh, Kelly Retaliak from Angus Genetics, Inc., uh, Shane Bedwell from the American Hereford Association, and Dr. Jackie Atkins from the uh, American Simmental Association. And they're going to talk about various incentive programs that their respective organizations offer in an attempt to garner additional phenotypes uh, and genotypes. So as I mentioned, our first speaker for the day is Dr. Larry Keene. Uh, and uh, Larry, you might, uh, might go ahead and bring your slides up as I, I finish your introduction. Uh, Larry was raised on a, a diversified beef cattle and farming operation near Hartwell, Nebraska. Uh, he received a bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of Nebraska, uh, master's and PhDs in uh, animal breeding and genetics, the master's degree from Colorado State, uh, and the PhD from Virginia Tech. He actually was hired as a postdoc at U.S. Mark in 2006, and then later that same year, uh, was hired on as a permanent scientist. Uh, Dr. Keene's actually a co-leader of the germplasm evaluation program. Uh, and those of you somewhat familiar with that program, and those of you that are certainly avid BIF goers, um, would realize that this is the program that on an annual basis uh, generates updates on uh, breed of sire differences and of course uh, a crossbreed EPD adjustments for growth and carcass traits. Uh, he also leads efforts in genetics of bovine respiratory disease susceptibility and both finishing steer and growing heifer feed efficiency, uh, again, using subsets of the germplasm evaluation program there at US Mark. Uh, so that, with that, Larry, hopefully you can uh, take over and share your slides now. Should be working. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks Matt uh, for all of that. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, talk a little bit about recent work here uh, in collaboration with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, at getting a, getting a set of breed differences out for mature weight um, and try to make the case for this being an important trait to continue to look at and a trait that we uh, were incentivized to do in order to maybe get some ideas of what we can do with current mature weight EPDs that are out there and maybe developing sets of adjustment factors for those as well. So uh, just to, as a way of introduction, um, all of this really comes down to cow efficiency and cow efficiency is, a, is something that we just throw out there and expect everybody to know exactly what we're talking about and why it's important. But often it's not well defined really and people that, that use it and throw the term around usually mean different things. Um, everybody wants cow efficiency 
and and they'd say we have efficient cows in some cases or we want efficient cows or we want to make our cows more efficiency but what's meant by that and generally it's often defined um, on sort of a population based parameter um, for how much productivity are we getting out of our cows so it might be cows weaned per cow exposed that's what's thrown around often in your herd uh, cows weaned uh, versus uh, relative to the amount of energy required by the cow, by the cow exposed, number of cows exposed, or maybe total weaning weight, so the actual economic, uh, economically relevant profit center um, in terms of the weaning weight sold per year relative to the amount of feed we had to pay for our herd and the number of cows that were exposed. All of these are population-based measures and make it a little difficult to try to do something directly with uh, with our animal breeding tools or EPDs because uh, they're more herd indicators rather than individual animal indicators for selection for selection purposes so if we want to break it down to what we could do on individual animals what components go into these measures of efficiency um, we could make a pretty long and and I think pretty relevant list here um, what is it that keeps a cow productive? What is it that keeps her in the herd? And what is it that keeps her from costing too much? So uh, fertility is a component of that. The cow intake or energy requirements, you know, what does she need for maintenance, lactation, gestation, immunity overall? Um, what's the calf survival? How likely is the calf to survive both from as a trait of the cow and as a trait of the calf? What's the calf growth due to milk or due to individual direct genetic effects? What's the calf intake? How much is the calf costing to get to weaning or, or some other profit time, uh, center time like yearling weight? What, what are we doing to feed that calf out? And then what's the longevity of the cow on the herd? Or in other words, how often do we have to replace herd replace cows with uh, developed heifers and the cost of developing those heifers. Most of these, uh, although I could think of ways that all of these direct traits could be economically relevant traits, um, most of them are actually predicted by indirect measures. And when I'm talking about cow weight, it's really an indirect measure of this cow intake or energy requirement. What What is going into the maintenance of that cow? So, uh, so take that with a bit of a grain of salt here that, that what we're talking about is really an indicator of the profit, uh, that the economically relevant trade in the profit equation, which is really how much is that cow costing us to keep active and in the herd. So if we look back at, at some reasonably old research now, at 40 years old basically, and, uh, and think about our, our uh, or 30 years old, sorry, think about what um, components of our driving uh, feed intake in cows. At this time, this was done with some uh, 1970 samples of Hereford Angus, that's the AHX on the first bar over here, uh, Charlet cross, a Jersey cross, and a, uh, I believe that's a Simmental cross. And looking at what components were driving the amount of energy were, that was required by those cows to produce calves to 455 days of age. So if we look at that, you'll see that the two bars where there's the most variation generally in these are the red bars, which is the maintenance energy of the cow, and the blue bars, which are the lactation energy. And not surprisingly for the cattle at the time, the smaller cows, the Jersey and the Angus Hereford cross at the time, were requiring less maintenance energy than the Charlet and Simmental, which were, uh, would have been predicted to be much larger uh, at the time. And then the, the cows that produced more milk, the Jersey and the Simmental were costing more energy, even when not lactating, this is overall to produce that calf, than the other two. So, so growth um, is a major component, a metabolic weight of the animal. And, uh, and growth and that actual mature size is a major component of that cow intake. And yes, you can argue there are other uh, measures of intake in that cow that are important that might be independent of growth. There might be a residual uh, sort of measure for intake in cows that people could advocate looking at. I'm not arguing that intake outside of growth is not important, 
but growth is one of our, our most easily measured indicators of that efficiency and the intake of that cow. So if we think about what's happened, um, this is a slide developed by Dr. Larry Cundeff, my predecessor here, who worked on the germplasm evaluation for much of its years uh, when it was handled uh, cycles from in uh, two to four year blocks of sampling sires from the industry. And if we look at mature weight of the cows as a, as a raw number in the um, early 70s from cycles one and two, that's these red bars here, we see that at the time the British breeds, similar to the chart I just showed you, were much smaller, around a little over a thousand pounds relative to crosses based on the other continental breeds that were just coming into prominence in the U.S. at that time. Um, and if we look then uh, about uh, 30 years later, um, after much selection on, on traits like yearling weight, weaning weight, and, uh, and, and complexes like that, we see that what's happened over time is, and what had happened over that time was that the British breeds were now as big or heavier than most of those continental breeds in terms of these crosses. There is more to these numbers than just the bulls that were used in the germplasm evaluation program. As most of you know, that's done by AI sire. So each of these are actually mated to a base Hereford Angus cow. So there'd be a little bit of more heterosis, of course, in some of these continental breeds, which the blue lines are all the more striking, as if you think about it that way. Um, the cows were probably a fair bit smaller even than the average at that time because they were some base cows that, that came from another station when the Mean Island Research Center was starting. So these differences aren't all due to the industry differences, but cert or these, these actual values, the raw values aren't due to industry differences completely, but the differences between the animals in the blue lines and the animals in the red lines should be a pretty good indicator of, of how uh, cows have changed over that amount of time. So we wanted to get a, a much of much of the reason that's happened has been selection for yearling weight. And if we look at our British breed lines, these Hereford Angus and Red Angus here, we see all of them have steeply selected for yearling weight based on their reported genetic trend to the point where all of them are much smaller at yearling weight than some of the continental breeds and have now uh, nearly the same or higher as much of the continental breed complex or or angus near the top in yearling weight based on a cross breed epds and and genetic trends reported by the breed associations so we wanted to get a good idea as a result of that what are the breed differences today for mature weight and if there are differences what kind of recommendations or what kind of thoughts can people have in terms of what can be done to maybe control some of the increased feed costs due to the maintenance energy required by that larger cow. So to do this, uh, we actually worked with a graduate student, Madeline Zimmerman, um, who got her master's at the University of Nebraska with Matt, uh, your moderator here, and uh, Ron Lewis at that university. And she worked with us on germplasm evaluation data to uh, try to get an idea of current mature weight, uh, cow, cow mature weight breed differences, as well as the prototypes for what could become an across breed EPD adjustment factor should, should there be EPDs for these, uh, for mature weight reported by most of the breeds. And in order to do that, um, we took some steps back and thought about how should growth be modeled in order to get the best estimate of mature weight from the data we had here so that the the project had a component of modeling growth from weaning to mature, maturity, using that resulting model to predict mature weight and then estimating breed differences for mature weight. So the data, as I mentioned earlier, came from the germplasm evaluation program. This came from cycle seven, which is those late 90s samples you saw in that slide from Dr. Cundiff. Uh, bulls that were sampled in the 1990s, uh, more than 2,200 cows came from from that part for this project. And then the rest of the cows came from what is termed as continuous GPE. These are samples we've done since around uh, 2000, I should say 2006, apologize for that, 2000, but, but uh, the bulls were used here from 2006 through 2015 and 
based on time needed to get to mature weight, obviously that 2015 isn't getting to sort of a five or six year old weight cow yet, uh, but quite a few cows that were sampled in the mid 2000s, mid aughts, I guess, uh, would have had uh, good records for mature weight getting to five or six years of age. Um, there are 18 different breeds evaluated in this. Two breeds were more recent, so they're excluded from the results that I'll show here today. Um, but then uh, cows here at the germ, uh, at US Mark and the Germ Plasma Evaluation Program are weighed three times per year, once right before uh, parturition, once right before breeding, and once at palpation. So uh, take that, uh, with, with those number of records, we end up with quite a few weights on these cows if we project out the, the, uh, the weights to six years of age. So in terms of growth modeling, uh, we ended up concentrating on three different model approaches. I'll talk just a little bit about all three, but I wanna focus on the main one that we ended up choosing to use, which was the Brody function, a function, uh, uh, that's been published quite a while ago. It's, a, it's a, a function that increases over time at a decreasing rate and asymptotes to a maturity, a mature weight, which is what the A parameter in this equation is right here. That mature weight or, or, or the weight at a time, if you would put in time at six years of age over here, would be uh, would be an idea of what the mature weights could be that could are that could be used for this analysis. Um, this function, the Brody function, had the best fit among three that were compared, um, and and this was done through two steps in comparing these functions through first fitting all of the data together uh, across all animals to have this huge mass of of weights over six years. Uh, time frame, a six year time frame. And next, in order to get genetic parameters, we estimated the exact mature weight by doing a within animal fit of the Brody function and looking at that. This is the, all the data. If you see the kind of background uh, scatter plot behind here, the little uh, tan dots behind, and the fits of three functions that were evaluated by Madeline to this data. The functions were a Brody function that I already mentioned, that green bar, as I said, it increases at a decreasing rate. A spline function where the animals were fit with a linear growth pattern from birth to around uh, approximately 800 days of age. We didn't set that. We let the computer program set where that knot was, where that change is, and then fit with a different linear function after that. You'll notice it keeps going off um, as cows get over, older as it should as a as a line would and then a quadratic function this this red dotted line and and you'll see the two functions that were not this brody function while they did fit the data quite well they both have problems in different areas uh, due to changes at the extreme values that are difficult to use to project something where we're trying to stop at about six years of age so anyway we chose the Brody function to model this. Uh, we ended up deriving weight at six years of age on these within animal model fits and uh, on animals using only their own data. And the six year old weight then was fitted in an animal model uh, with relationships and breed effect covariates in order to get breed differences that we could use to say where are breeds currently at in terms of their mature weight. Um, so in terms of results, um, we estimated mature weight, heritability, and this ended up being a highly heritable trait, uh, around 0.6 heritability, 0.57, uh, much higher than most growth traits, which suggests direct selection on this trait could be very effective. Um, breed differences were adjusted for sampling of our bulls. As you know, we sample bulls from the industry, but over time, our means start to change from what industry means due, due to selection. And we hypothesized that yearling weight was probably the EPD that was driving changes in mature weight the most. So we adjusted our sample of bulls that we used to the average yearling weight EPD, their average of the bulls we used to the average weaning weight, yearling weight EPD in the industry right now in uh, 2017, I suppose, 2016, we probably used for the project. And this is similar to the adjustments we make to produce breed differences every year in the cross-breed EPD adjustment factor program. 
Um, results slide, you'll see similar to what Dr. Condiff showed, the British breeds are actually are quite heavy still. Uh, again, probably due to selection for, for yearling weight and, and, and correlated responses to that selection. What I want you to notice here is that several of the other breeds, as a breed of sire, remember this is one half of the breed difference. So this is the difference as you'd expect if all these breeds were mated to some third uh, breed of sire that, or breed of cow that's not on here right now. Um, you can see that these these one half of breed differences that that some of the continental breeds are not quite as large and there's some opportunity for complementarity with some breeds that that have not gained uh, and have probably have not selected for growth quite as much so if trying to select if 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 commercial producers are trying to select a cow herd or moderate a cow herd there is certainly opportunity for that within these uh these breed estimates um, remember, these are only differences right now and adjusted from zero uh, where Angus is representing the base. Um, the actual weight here is probably something close to around um, 1,350 pounds to 1,400 pounds, and that's what these might be deviated from. So regardless of what you look at, animals have gotten quite big. If you were thinking about these animals as purebreds, remember this is half of a breed differences. So these differences would be doubled and maybe subtracted from something like 1,350 pounds if, if they were going to be used and applied. So uh, based on all of that, it seems that some breed differences have moderated while others are larger than they were. Uh, other differences are larger than what they were based on that cycle seven. Uh, slide I showed earlier from Dr. Cundiff. There's a real opportunity for breed complementarity in all of this and, and this is a place where we might want to think about as researchers and an extension about the importance of complementarity not just in heterosis in terms of commercial cattle production. Um, selection programs should consider effects of growth on mature weight and subsequent costs so as breeds are developing mature weight EPDs. There are a few out there right now. Um, looking at that and in indices for the actual cost of production relative to what is gained through through production of beef with, with increased growth should be considered in, in future decision support programs, uh, which would be selection indices or other types of programs that could happen. This cow herd efficiency as, a, as overall remains pretty important here at the U.S. Mark. Um, we uh, we, we want to keep continuing to look at things that, that focus on the cost of maintaining cows and part of what we do here is in addition to just looking at this way, we've got programs where we're looking at the intake of these cows as well. And most of that is ongoing because this takes quite a while to collect data and some of the cow intake records are, are probably be about, uh, about a half to three quarters of the way complete relative to this mature weight right now. But we hope to have that that type of data uh, released and 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 help further inform this breed difference picture in the future. I want to acknowledge our collaborators at the University of Nebraska, especially Madeline, for for taking charge of this project and 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 working with it, as well as my co-leaders of the germplasm evaluation project, uh, Mark Tallman and Warren Snelling. And with that, I don't know if you want to take questions now, Matt, or or how to move forward. Yeah, Larry, uh, first of all, thank you for that. And, and if there are any questions from our audience, if you type them into the chat box, we've got one here from uh, Bruce Golden. Uh, and Bruce asks, uh, would you recommend a mature weight EPD, a maintenance uh, energy, presumably EPD, or both? Yeah, so the good question, Bruce, and I know exactly what Bruce is driving at here with, with what I said about indicators relative to economically important traits. I have no problem with, with, with and, and it should be encouraged to have the economic indicator, whether that is an energy, in, energy EPD or something else that gets at overall energy cost. That's, that's what we need to be driving at, right? We need to say, what is it costing us to keep this animal? I'm not necessarily uh, advocating that we should have a mature weight EPD at, uh, alone or at all, that, that the economic indicator or the economically relevant traits much more important. Um, 
I want to get started though by saying we probably need this mature weight data to parameterize that. Mature weight is going to be a component, an indicator, and in whatever model we're using to derive that sort of EPD, even if it is an energy EPD. And so part of the reason for me staying with mature weight as a focus on this is because one, it's a tank I said at the end on the breed difference perspective, and two, I want to encourage uh, the audience, this audience, to uh, to continue to develop programs that that data gets collected. So uh, no no argument at all. Economically relevant trait, the cost of the production is what what we should be driving at here. Let's get the steps to get that in place. Thanks, Larry. Um, other questions for, for Larry? I know he has a, a meeting right at one o'clock, so uh, he may or may not be on uh, towards the end. Uh, another question, Larry, what effect has the quest for marbling affected mature weight and cow efficiency? Yeah, that's, a, that's also a good question, uh, Matt. Um, and, and not something I have an exact answer physiologically, I can't tell you for sure, so what I'm going to be say is going to be hypothesizing somewhat. Um, marbling, um, we all know that that fat takes more energy to put on than muscle. Um, marbling increasing over time and the composition of the gain involved with increasing marbling has probably led to our animals being fatter. We know it has in terms of marbling and, and probably correlator, correlator response with other fat depots. Um, Given that, and mature weight doesn't tell all of this picture necessarily, we may have energy requirements for intake types of measures, uh, which would drive at the energy and cost of energy. Um, that may be increased because of marbling as well as just growth alone. And, and I could anticipate if the cows are getting fatter, if the composition of the cows is more fat, they probably take more to maintain that fat and and muscle relative to a leaner cow. So that would be my guess. Um, I don't necessarily have the direct data that's going to say that. Um, intakes that we have on, on uh, cattle that, that, uh, that slaughter and get that we harvest and we end up with back fat and marbling measurements on it, those animals typically take more energy to grow. I imagine that affects the maintenance picture as well. Right, thank you. Um, maybe while we wait to see if there's uh, a, another quick question, uh, Larry, I might ask you to, to go ahead and, and unshare your slides. Sure, and sure. Jackie, I'd ask you to take control and maybe begin sharing yours. And so we'll go ahead and transition into the, the second part then of uh, today's session where we hear about uh, incentive programs from uh, breed association staff. And uh, the first in, in that lineup is Dr. Jackie Atkins, uh, who's the Director of Science and Education at the American Simmental Association. Jackie's a native actually of North Dakota, uh, grew up working at her family's veterinary clinic and commercial cow-calf operation. She has a bachelor's degree in biotechnology from Montana State and uh, both a master's and PhD. Uh, and reproductive physiology in beef cattle from the University of uh, Missouri. And prior to joining the American Simmental Association in 2013, uh, she actually worked as an embryologist uh, near Belgrade, uh, Montana. Uh, so with that, Jackie, I'd turn it over to you. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, Jackie. So yeah, thank you to the organizers for giving the American Simmental Association a chance to talk about some of our incentive programs. I'm going to focus on some of the ones revolving around genotyping, um, but we've got some other programs that, that help collect more um, phenotypes as well. Um, but each of these also have a, a phenotype collection component uh, as well. So the first program I was going to talk about is the cow herd DNA roundup. This started uh, about a year ago. It launched a year ago and was really an investment in um, an R&D effort from the uh, board of directors here at, at the American Semitol Association and also a collaboration uh, with GeneSeq. 
So when we launched this, we had three main goals. The first was to really quickly um, ramp up the number of genotyped animals that we have in our genomic evaluation as uh, increasing that pool helps us predict uh, future uh, genomics and, and increase the predictive abilities in, in future um, uh, genotyped animals. We also wanted to do this uh, with whole herds, with whole groups, whole contemporaries to reduce the prediction bias that we see. So most of the time people are genotyping their top 1% or their top 10% uh, of the animals in their herd, but we really wanted to get a better picture of the entire group. And we wanted to focus on females. We wanted to be able to improve our maternal trait predictions. And so this is, this is solely for the cow herd. So what are the requirements of the cowherd DNA Roundup? Uh, we ask that our members commit to genotyping their entire herd. And we've set a window for wiggle room for animals that are, have died or been sold or are recipients and they're not really that interested in it. So they need to commit to sending us a DNA sample on 90% of the cowherd. They can include samples on uh, weanling and yearling heifers. In fact, we encourage that, but that doesn't count towards the 90% um, uh, requirement. Females need to have an entity in the ASA database. That's how we incorporate them into the genomic evaluation. And um, our, our metric that we give back are genomically enhanced EPDs. So the females need to have an in order uh, for this to be a valuable tool. That does not mean they need to be registered. They can either be registered or in one of our whole herd reporting or total herd enrollment options uh, that return EPDs on the entire cow herd. Um, so we certainly are doing this with a lot of our Simmental seed stock operations, but we also have a lot of non-traditional seed stock, other breeds and, and commercial herds in the program as well, and we sure welcome all of those types of operations. Uh, so what's the cost of investment to our members? Uh, it's $20 a test and um, that's 60% off of our retail price. And this is a GGP LD, the 50K product. We, uh, tying into Larry's talk, we really wanna encourage more mature weights and body condition scores coming into our database. And so if uh, the, um, breeder or the operation commits to sending 90% of, of their herd, sending in mature weights with a body condition score ideally or hip height, then they'll get $5 off as a rebate. So that's a $15 genomic test. Um, this includes parent verification. As long as we have uh, the parents of those animals on file, we can make that comparison. If not, we just, uh, we have these parentage markers on file for future progeny comparisons. Um, and we also get uh, coat color dilution included at the price. Add-on content is available at our regular uh, price points. And we've had a number of herds that have, have benefited from that as well. A uh, big thing to note is that this, the first phase of this program has a December 15th deadline of this year. So if anybody's interested in doing it, I uh, need to hop on that pretty quickly. So what do folks get back? They get genomically enhanced EPDs. That is, that is our uh, deliverable. And, um, but if you think about it, for a lot of these traits, that's a lifetime uh, of calf records. That's more records than they'll see um, in, in their production for a lot of traits. And so uh, we feel like this is a, a good use of everybody's um, funds. And again, to reiterate, you must first have EBTs in our system, otherwise um, the, the information won't be um, very usable to the, to the folks. Going back to the goals of the project, uh, where are we now? Remember, we wanted to quickly ramp up the number of genotyped animals in whole herds and focusing on females. 
So since March of this year, that's when we really start, we had the staff uh, committed to um, handling the samples and sending them into the labs and getting results back. We've added just under 25,000 cow genomic profiles and that's all on entire herds and I didn't pull how many mature weights and body condition scores uh, but the the majority of these are coming in with with mature weights and body condition scores so we're we're pretty happy about that and we have an office full of samples to continue on and I say we I should mention uh, Leoma Wells uh, was really the lead in the workhorse in this area she's um, recently gone on to some other, um, another phase of her career and she'll be missed, but I sure want to give credit to, to the, the person who did all this work. Um, so we have more in development. Uh, we we um, are, are starting a new program here focusing on carcass traits and I think this table really illustrates uh, the, the things that we're after nicely. So this has our progeny equivalents in 2012 when we first came out and started doing genomically enhanced EPDs. Um, and then our progeny equivalent traits from April of this year, right when we uh, released this IGS multi-breed genetic evaluation powered by Bolt, which really kind of revolutionized the way we were using the uh, genomic um, data in the evaluation. And so you can see we've made a lot of improvements in, in, that, in that six years. We've uh, increased progeny equivalence to 10 for calving ease, increased a lot across our growth traits, but maternal calving ease really hasn't moved at all. And again, we, we just were really shy on female genotypes. So hopefully this uh, cow herd DNA Roundup program will, will help us do a better job of predicting um, maternal calving ease. The other thing to note is that while we've made some improvement in the carcass traits, it's not nearly to the same level as we have in, in some of the other uh, traits. And so we um, have launched a new program and it's really, really new. So the details aren't as spelled out as the Cowherd DNA Roundup, uh, but it's a carcass expansion project. So again, our board has, has um, dedicated funds to invest in this, in this project. And the goal of the project is to really, again, hit the gas pedal on bringing in more carcass records into the evaluation, but also genotyping as many of those calves as we possibly can. And so um, we're currently collaborating with Allflex on this one and, and may um, develop some other um, partners in this research endeavor, but really hoping to um, to be able to do a better job of, of predicting this very, very important um, section of, of the beef industry in the future. So um, with that, uh, here's some reference points to get some more information. Our website uh, certainly is a good place to start and also the Cowherd DNA Roundup um, email is listed here and the CARC data email. Those are good points uh, for specific questions in our our phone number. So thanks to our collaborators and, and thank you, Matt and, and the group for having us on. All right. Thank you, Jackie. Um, if anyone has a, a burning question for Jackie, you can go ahead and type it into the, uh, the chat box, but um, you can also feel free to ask questions, particularly of our, our three breed association uh, staff members, maybe at the, the end of their collective presentations as well. Um, and, and so with that, Jackie, I might ask you to uh, go ahead and, yep, unshare. And if uh, Kelly might be able to pick it up now. Um, our, our next uh, presenter uh, is uh, Kelly Retallick from, uh, who's the genetic service director um, for Angus Genetics Inc. And in her role, uh, she assists in coordinating genetic education outreach programs tailored to Angus breeders and commercial producers alike. Uh, she grew up on a seed stock operation and received her bachelor's degree from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison in animal science and then a master's degree in animal breeding and genetics from Kansas State University. And during her master's uh, program, she worked very closely with scientists at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, including Dr. Larry Keene, a uh, previous speaker in today's session, uh, looking at alternative gain sources 
uh, or really looking at, at differences in, in uh, gain and uh, uh, feed intake and efficiency. And, and recently, uh, she's decided to uh, pursue a, a, a PhD, um, also at Kansas State University in uh, quantitative genetics. So, Kelly, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you, Kelly. Okay, great. So, um, thanks, Matt, for allowing AGI and, and the rest of the group there for uh, us to be a part of this particular um, schedule here. So, first off, I just wanted to throw up kind of our current fees and costs for the membership, because obviously anytime we talk about data or genotype um, incentives, it comes directly out of, you know, basically what our members have put into the association. So, you know, where is our best source um, for us to apply those funds? And really here at the association, we've kind of obviously pinpointed a few areas where we could increase the amount of uh, both data um, in different areas for us to continue to have a, a robust evaluation for our members. So the first place that we've really started to target is these cow production records. So it's of no secret that the American Angus Association does not have a stayability or longevity type EPD available for our membership. While we do have things like heifer pregnancy and, and dollar energy and calving use maternal and calving use direct for our membership, um, we don't have that longevity portion. And so in about 2014, we had the Maternal Plus program launched, which is basically just an alternative Angus Herd Improvement Record Recording Service where it's a voluntary system where our members can hop on and actually have a whole herd inventory based system. And so in order to prompt people to get into that program so we can reach our goals of basically producing that longevity type EPD, we put a cash back incentive on, on the fees we just saw on that previous slide. And so our goal is to get 150,000 females re enrolled in the program. And basically, if I signed up tomorrow, I would have one year after my re enrollment, I would get a 5% uh, cash back rebate on those fees you see listed below. And every year after that, up until we re enroll 150,000 females, basically they get a 2.5% a cash back. So a bit of a reward for those members who are basically building that database, which then in return, is going to help all Angus members, right, and basically using the Angus genetics in the commercial um, cow calf industry and beyond. And so that is one area where we've targeted. Um, that's been up for six months, and, I, and I'm happy to say that we do have a 23% growth in that program. We're getting to a point where we can start to do some preliminary research on the facet of getting uh, longevity EPDs out to our membership. So we're pretty excited how that program has taken off. When we think of another place where we always continue to want to collect data, um, it's going to be with our true carcass records. You know, those harvest records that come from JBS and Tyson and Cargill. Um, you know, much like the carcass records Jack is trying to get at in Senecal Association. Obviously, we're very proud of our association, um, our members and commercial producers and users of Angus genetics alike. You can see that, you know, we have 2.1 million ultrasound records, but when we put it up against our carcass records, we have about 120,000 of those. And so basically we've recreated our structured sire evaluation program. Obviously we had structured sire evaluation programs in the 70s and 80s in the advent um, of EPDs and um, EBDs. But with this structured sire evaluation, basically what we're doing is we're designing a progeny test um, and targeting commercial herds that can breed at least 300 cows or more AI. Um, from there, basically, we do take DNA on those in individual animals to obviously sire match those calves and have the opportunity to run some genomic tests, um, Angus GS and other 50K tests on those individual animals to basically increase the amount of carcass records in our database and, and genomic records on those carcass animals alike. Um, where does the incentive come in? Well, the incentive comes in on that commercial producer side. So the board made the initiative basically for every sire identified uh, structured sire evaluation cap for every carcass record that comes back to us, basically we give them a premium on top of how they sell those animals. Now, we can identify these animals also for other research um, projects. For instance, um, in January, we released the first ever uh, foot score EPDs um, for the American Angus Association, and we've been targeting these types of animals 
in these commercial feedlots and settings to gather some of that data as well. Um, so just, just certain programs like that that we can look at and continue to drive some research through this structured sire evaluation project. Um, from a genotyping standpoint, I guess American Angus Association hasn't really um, created a certain program to incentivize genotyping. I would say the fact that our membership um, continues to believe in this technology allows us to create incentives um, basically membership-wide. So you can kind of see our breakdown of how our genotypes have rolled into our evaluation um, with the different price breaks. I would say that was probably the biggest incentive for us to keep genotyping. Obviously, early on in those years, um, you know, at that $75 price point, we were probably capturing those top 10 to 15 percent of our animals, those animals that we thought um, or our producers thought early on were really good and they wanted to genotype those. But really with our cost breaks, we've been seeing increased genotyping much deeper into the herds. Um, we see individual producers, you know, genotyping the whole contemporary group of bulls that are going to be sold in this commercial industry much like other breed associations would witness as well. Along with that, really with our $45 and $37 price points, we've seen a, a good increase in female genotyping. Um, and, and in most cases when our producers, you know, when I talk to them and, and when we see those tests roll in, they are genotyping their whole range of replacement type of females. And so we feel rather confident that, you know, the own, um, basically the marketplace is taking care of the genotyping costs and that our members see the benefit of that. Uh, just to give you a snapshot of, of what we're seeing from a male-female perspective, the red line there, you can see that's our male testing. Um, we don't have the 2018 year on here yet, but last year when we pulled the numbers, basically 57% of our genomic database um, having right around that 550,000 genotypes in our database, we had 57% of them were males and 43% of the total genomic tests that, profile tests that came through AGI were actually done on females. So again, kind of seeing where um, we have that from 2016, 2017, we can kind of see a tick up um, in our female testing. And really that's just due to the fact that we're able to, to leverage the amount of testing our members do with the labs in order to drive down costs for them. And then, Obviously, um, I would say that the best overall incentive that, you know, really any of us, any of us have um, to get people to genotype and phenotype more is, is to make sure that we use that investment that they have put into the genotyping and the data to, to give them the most accurate technologies and evaluations as we possibly can um, for our members to use. And I think really that's what keeps any member coming back um, to phenotyping and genotyping is when we give them good accurate tools to use in their selection process. So that's pretty much all I have for you today um, as far as incentives that we use here at the American Institute. Right, great. Thank you for that, Kelly. Uh, and again, uh, similarly, if, if anyone has any burning questions for Kelly, please uh, type them in uh, to the, the chat box. Um, and while you're thinking of those questions, yeah, I might go ahead and ask, uh, uh, our last breed association representative for today's session, Mr. Shane Bedwell, to go ahead and uh, take over the screen. Uh, Shane's currently the Chief Operating Officer and Director of Breed Improvement for the American Hereford Association, uh, and he works closely with the AHA's genetic evaluation, uh, as well as their National Reference Sire Program. Uh, prior, coming, prior to joining uh, the American Hereford Association, Shane was on faculty at Colorado State and served as their livestock judging coach for eight years. Um, uh, actually uh, went to school at Butler County Community College where he received his associate's degree, uh, then his uh, bachelor's degree in animal science at Kansas State University, and he completed his master's work uh, at the University of Illinois in the area of beef cattle nutrition. Shane actually hails from near Medicine Lodge, Kansas, um, where he still helps manage his family's cow-calf operation, which consists of a three-breed rotational cross, which as you might assume uh, includes Hereford, uh, but also Angus and Red Angus. So Shane, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, Shane, we're not, not able to hear you yet.
Hey, Matt, how about now? Yep, got you now, Shane. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, uh, definitely uh, have enjoyed these uh, brown bagger sessions over time and commend the, the crew for uh, putting in the time and effort organization to put them together. I wanted to share uh, quickly uh, this afternoon two kind of programs that we're very proud of here at the American Hereford Association. Uh, the newest program that, that we have uh, going on uh, as uh, an offer for our uh, membership to take advantage of is our whole herd DNA cow herd project. We launched this uh, last uh, December and uh, this was really an effort to uh, gain kind of as Jackie uh, stated, uh, an effort to gain um, more uh, information on production females uh, that we have uh, through our whole herd reporting system uh, to uh, increase the genetic prediction, the genetic uh, value uh, of those uh, females. Uh, we started with whole herd reporting here at Hereford in 2001. And so we had uh, numerous uh, phenotypes and uh, a, a great plethora of data on those females over time. Um, but much like uh, all associations as uh, uh, genetic uh, testing and, and genomic prediction first was kind of done mainly on bulls. And we really needed to marry uh, that valuable production data through whole herd reporting with um, the genotype to really uh, get uh, the prediction that we all want. And so as we uh, launched our updated uh, genetic evaluation there last December uh, with uh, uh, the Bolt software and, and the different uh, changes that we did to our evaluation, uh, we just weren't comfortable yet with uh, making some of those, uh, those good uh, those calls. And so this was something that we collaborated with GeneSeq to put together a program to incentivize our membership. And uh, it's basically all cows on your inventory uh, in order to participate with this. Um, you have to submit all the females on your cow herd uh, um, inventory uh, once that's updated either in the spring or the fall. Uh, the cost of this test is uh, $20 and uh, you get back parentage, uh, the abnormalities, uh, genomic profile and then we also provide a uh, TSU uh, for the member to collect this sample. Uh, that way we can improve the efficiency and uh, have a, a much better sampling uh, method and uh, it's a nice process that we've been able to work through with Allflex as well as GeneSeq and try to make it as automated as possible on our end. And so we're, we're very encouraged by the membership uptake in this program and uh, are looking forward to uh, getting more samples as we go forward. The other program that I wanna share a, a little bit about is our National Reference Sire Program. Uh, that was started in 1999, kind of in the way that it's structured today. And uh, what members have the opportunity to do is nominate young sires or semi-proven bulls. Um, and uh, we kind of facilitate that nomination and then disperse that to our uh, reference uh, test herds. We have seven of those test herds going today. And uh, we can collect uh, progeny data through those uh, sire groups uh, completely from birth all the way through harvest. And in the last uh, four years have been able to acquire dry matter intake data. Uh, we also take a genotype on these cattle as well. And so it's really kind of the, the perfect storm of being able to get unbiased third party data uh, on uh, the sire groups, uh, on these sires that have been submitted and, and gone uh, through the test. Uh, we get uh, all that valuable information that's so hard to collect and uh, we uh, actually work to pay or incentivize uh, the genotype cost. Uh, we've facilitated in uh, collecting that dry matter intake data, whether that's uh, helping uh, put together these facilities um, or uh, building other facilities around the country or just helping pay uh, these test herds uh, on, on a per head basis. And so uh, I, I commend uh, the folks uh, in, in the roles uh, and before me that really led the leadership to get uh, these initiatives because it's uh, 
definitely paying off. Um, we've tested over about 375 sires. Uh, we bred uh, over 3,500 cows uh, this uh, and heifers this uh, spring. And our plans are to double this as we go forward. And a couple of our test herds, uh, we also have uh, them enrolled in our cow inventory program and uh, are genotyping those females as well and collecting mature cow weight data. So uh, that's something that is a, a cost to the members to enroll in this program, but I think the, 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 the great thing about it is they get so much information. Uh, it's big contemporary group data, and so it, it definitely uh, uh, is, is something that is valuable uh, to those members, plus the incentives that uh, that we have done from a, a breed improvement and uh, an organization uh, at the American Hereford Association, and commend the board of directors for uh, uh, seeing value in uh, this program. So Matt, those are the two things that uh, that that I uh, have the slides on today, and so I'll I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thanks, Shane. Uh, we do have a, a few minutes uh, left here, uh, and, and we still have uh, all three of our uh, breed association representatives still on the line. So uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions for either uh, Jackie, Kelly, or Shane, please go ahead and, uh, if you would, type those into the, the chat box. Um, one thing that, I, that was really apparent to me is, is all three uh, discuss their various incentive programs is the the really, uh, really the necessity of engaging in some way uh, the commercial industry in, in getting those, whether it be through uh, identifying herds for uh, structured sire tests, uh, whether it be actually incentivizing commercial producers to uh, maybe more routinely genotype and record phenotypic data uh, on their animals and begin to construct some kind of pedigree. Um, it, it was really evident to me that it requires engagement at the commercial sector level uh, to be able to, to get a lot of these, uh, these types of phenotypes. So uh, really applaud those associations for making the effort to do so. So um, next week, I'll bring this back up. Um, all right. Next week, uh, October 31st, we'll actually have our, our last uh, Brown Bagger session in this series. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, two things. Uh, Dare Bullock from the University of Kentucky will be our host that day. I'm actually going to give a presentation on uh, selection indices, but uh, maybe focus a bit more on um, where I think indices can evolve uh, from where we are currently. And as part of that discussion, I'll talk about a relatively recent uh, funded USDA grant um, that uh, the folks at Clay Center, uh, Bob Weber, Bruce Golden, and I are working on uh, to really develop web-based decision support tools uh, for the beef industry. And then we'll also have uh, a little bit of a look inside the, the program for the upcoming Beef Improvement Federation annual meeting, which will be held in 2019. Uh, in South Dakota. So hopefully a little bit of insight on what we might expect to learn uh, from those meetings. Uh, so with that, just a reminder again, um, that if you missed any of uh, this year's session um, or any past year sessions, um, they're available at um, uh, www.nbcec.org. Uh, one quick question. Um, uh, any interest in collecting biosensor data for health diagnostics? And I'll turn that over to the, the Breed Association folk, folks. Uh, so uh, Shane, Jackie, uh, Kelly, if you're still with us, um, I'd let you take a stab at that. If there's any interest in your organizations in collecting biosensor data for health diagnostics. Um, well, I guess I'll take a stab. I would, um, I would make it a 
bit more general and say that we're, we're looking into doing a better job of collecting health diagnostics and, and what that looks like. And so um, we're right in the middle of um, trying to talk through some different guidelines there. And um, so I guess I wouldn't limit it to just the biosensor data, but, um, but doing a better job of, of collecting health phenotypes and, and using those for selection. Right. Kelly or Shane, either of you wish to weigh in on that? Yeah, we've we've uh, started to collect some uh, initial initial uh, phenotype data at a couple of our uh, reference sire herds, but uh, have not uh, gone to the extent that uh, Scott's question asked. So that's uh, definitely something that we can look to for in the future. Right. Kelly, I don't know if you're still with us and want to weigh in or not. I would just say that overall, I think that's an intriguing possibility. Um, but uh, I think part of the utility of that data is predicated on uh, uh, really the granularity of the data that we can obtain. Um, so if it is, uh, um, let's just say sensor data based on animal movement, but all we're allowed to receive are predictions based on um, what behavior state that animal is in, um, but, but maybe aren't able to, uh, to have access to um, the, the raw data, then perhaps the utility of it becomes less in some because we're actually using a prediction already uh, to inform additional prediction. So I actually, I think I think that's an exciting arena, Scott, um, uh, but we have to really think about what is the data we actually want to start from. All right. Well, I don't see any additional questions. We landed on a real thought-provoking one, as you might suspect, from Scott Newman, uh, so I appreciate that, uh, Scott. Again, thank you guys for uh, attending today's session, and I certainly hope to see you back here uh, next week for the fourth and final session uh, in the, the 2018 series. So thank you and have a good day.